SCC 13052, Commonwealth v. Tony A. Tinsley. Attorney Greenbaum. Good morning. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court. The Commonwealth is here appealing the judge's decision allowing the defendant's motion for new trial. Uh, this was the sort of horrific violent crime that the home invasion statute uh, is directed at and that the legislature intended to penalize more seriously. And the evidence, the Commonwealth's position is that the evidence in this case was, had sufficient, was sufficient to establish all the elements of armed home invasion. Uh, Attorney Greenberg, how so? How so, just given the facts in this case? How so? The defendants, I guess the big place we come into here is the notion of uh, the purpose of the statute and the idea of dwelling place. Understandably, well, not understandably, the defendant and the judge's position is that since for purposes of burglary statutes and as in Goldoff, the garage may be considered part of the dwelling house, that in order, if someone breaks into a garage prior to breaking into the home and only arms himself in the garage, well, then, then there's no possibility of armed home invasion. The Commonwealth's position is that if you look at the purpose of the home invasion statute, which is set out in the uh, in the case, Anton March or whatever, which is meant to protect persons rather than property. And to the extent that the statute uses that different term, dwelling place rather than dwelling house, that it would make sense and be more reasonable to think that, and the, in particular, the knowledge element, that we're talking about someone who's armed, who breaks and enters into a dwelling place, uh, knowing, knowing or having reason to know that people are inside. In this case, the defendants who unsuccessfully tried to break directly into the house in the middle of the night got into the garage, found a car, found the keys to get in through the locked door in the garage, in the garage, there was no one in the garage. This defendant apparently armed himself with a screwdriver prior to going in. We can assume that was in anticipation that- Attorney Greenbaum, can you in. answer one question for me? Because I, I don't oh, want to okay. move on too much without clearing this up. Okay. In your brief, you mentioned the issue with the trial judge at the hearing. Is it the Commonwealth's contention that if a suspect is armed and breaks into a an attached garage, that they cannot in, in, in encounters a resident in the garage, that that suspect cannot be charged with armed home invasion? No, no, the judge missed that. That was, I don't believe uh, the Commonwealth in writing or an oral argument said anything that would be that. If all the other I, elements- I'm asking you directly, I'm asking you directly, is that the Commonwealth's position no, that you- No, that is not- charged? But doesn't that, counsel, doesn't that follow logically from your argument? No, no, it doesn't follow Why logically not? from my argument at all. The Commonwealth's argument is that yes, the garage, the attached garage in this case, can be a dwelling house for purposes of burglary. And if prior to entering that attached garage in the dwelling house, the defendants are armed and they know or have reason to know someone's in the garage, perhaps because there's music there, perhaps because of what other, any other factor, something like here, and they break in and people are in there and those people are assaulted, that's armed home invasion because it is an entry into a dwelling place. What the Commonwealth is suggesting is that we should uh, interpret for the purposes of this particular statute, dwelling place should be interpreted such, not that it's limited to the dwelling house totally, but that it could be a dwelling house or any separate portion mm -hmm. of a dwelling house that is a place of habitation. So it's that's, the that's the key difference that here. If, if, if the uh, defendant entered into the garage didn't mm -hmm. encounter anybody, didn't arm himself, but then entered into the kitchen and found a knife and then went upstairs where people were sleeping, then that would be armed home invasion? No. Because no, that the wouldn't defendant be armed, armed home invasion himself because while they, in the house excuse, before encountering people? Well, I would say the bedroom is not a separate portion of the uh, place of, of the portion of the living quarters of the house, that other portion Why? of the- Why? Well, how do we draw that line? Uh, I think it would be, it would, that's a difficulty, but I, I, I think that, well, it's, it's only difficult a, if we it's adopt almost, your It's position. almost a sort, of, Your Honor, it's your almost sort of a common sense it. distinction that you, you have to draw the line somewhere. And there may be instances where a bedroom might be considered a separate portion of a dwelling house. But in this particular case, I think the line can be clearly seen. 
You've got a garage that's not typically part of a dwelling of where people live. It might be, and there might be an instance where it is a home invasion, but you have separate a separate portion of this larger concept of dwelling house that we clearly understand might be a place of habitation. And in this case is the place of habitation and the defendants now have um, a reason to believe someone's entering. If I, as a matter of comfort, for example- Attorney Greenbaum, let me yes. ask you a quick question before you go on. Yeah. You, I want to make sure I, I heard you. I think you did say that the garage generally is part of the dwelling place. Is that is dwelling that house? Garage is part of the dwelling house and could okay. be part of the dwelling place. Yes. The garage could be. But in yes. you're saying that in this particular case, under these facts, it's not. No. No, I'm not saying it's not. I'm saying it's not. The, I'm saying. I guess the difficulty the judge had and the difficulty the courts had with these, I'm not suggesting that because they, that the dwelling house is some, is, that the garage is all that important. When, what's important is, did the defendants arm themselves with that requisite knowledge, the defendant in this case, before they entered a portion of the dwelling that they know to be a place of habitation, that is a separate portion, this place of habitation. If I could offer an an example, can I get there? If we look back at Goldoff, that case well, where- I think we have a question here. You might- I'm sorry, might I'm sorry. The question. Well, well, my memory is, and, and you'll know that we have statutes that's, that specifically address arming themselves therein, correct? That's, this is, I, oh boy, do we? <laughs> Yeah, in is fact, the burglary any... statute that you compared to discusses right. that possibility. Yeah, burglary, yeah, so yeah, burglary. yes, yes, yeah. It I takes Justice Wendland's hypothetical into account some of those other statutes where yes. someone grabs a knife and we penalize those. Right. Unlike this statute, correct? So, so don't, aren't we supposed to draw a distinction between statutes that have specific language and those that do not? Well, the issue here, I don't think, is the arm therein or not. The, the issue where I agree that this statute does not penalize someone who arms themselves inside the dwelling place of another. Well, the does issue, it sound uh, like the charge was wrong? How so? No, no, I, I don't. Okay. Aren't you, you're running up against a huge amount of case law that we got interpreting the burglary statute. Um, and even cases like Doucette, which say that the same reasoning should apply in the armed home invasion context too, right? And to add to it, by, by making, you are protect, I mean, we're concerned about um, the danger to people when someone invade where they live, right? Mm -hmm. And you protect your garage. If I hear someone in my garage, I may go out and check, right? To see if they're mm -hmm. there which means I may be exposed to danger that way. So that's yes. why we broadly interpret the statute as protecting the whole dwelling area, right? And um, I understand that. And if you go into that garage and the, the, you're assaulted in there and you satisfy the knowledge of that would also be harm. But, but you, can't harm have it both, you can't have it both ways, can you? Because we're saying, uh, uh, Ruiz says, that if you arm yourself within the dwelling, right, it's not, you're not, you're not, you don't violate the statute, right? And if the dwelling house includes the garage and you arm yourself in the garage, it's a weird case because it narrows liability rather than broadens it. But it, I, let, me, you stuck? Uh, uh, let me suggest, I don't believe you're stuck in, and it's hard to find a, a Another example, but let me go. I wanted to mention the Goldoff situation, where mm -hmm. this court found that uh, a burg, uh, an intruder, had gone into an apartment and then came out to the, was encountered by the apartment dweller in the hallway and was assaulted with the gun. That this court, uh, what was actually the appeals court held that the common hallway is deemed to be part of the dwelling house, and that's in, under burglary. Let me pose the, and, and I normally it's this court that poses hypotheticals. Assume that <laughs> case is turned around and a thief who's intending to steal these paintings in this defendant's apartment, victim's apartment, first breaks into the common hallway. He approaches the apartment that he intends to steal from, hoping no one's there, and he hears music or sound or light and has reasonably, oh, someone's in there. 
and out in the common hallway, which is part of the dwelling house, but isn't the apartment, grabs a baseball bat and then breaks through the door with a baseball bat and uses assaults that. Why? I have to that believe is, the legislature. That is our, that is I have to case. believe, excuse me? That is our case, but. I it, have it, to believe the legislature would have in, intended and the language permits this court to interpret that statute to say that that's an armed home invasion. But it's an well, armed home invasion. Why isn't it that, that they, go ahead, Justice Castle, please. No, 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 go ahead, Justice Lewis, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the whole premise, and this is ultimately going to get back, get to the issue of what happens at resentencing if we disagree with you. This is a terrible case. Judge Agostini made it clear at sentencing mm -hmm. uh, with what he had to say, how serious this is. And your hypothetical is serious. But as uh, Justice Gaziano just mentioned, there's something to address a serious case. There's an armed burglary that has a serious maximum penalty and a mandatory minimum. And, and, and maybe that gets to the sentencing issue, but there, there, there is a statute specifically available to deal with this very serious situation so that we do not need to ignore all of our cases on what constitutes entering a dwelling. I'm not suggesting that, th that this court, again, I, and maybe this, I'm never going to get past this conundrum that everybody seems to yeah, deal actually, with. Yeah, actually, Attorney Greenbaum, I'm going to yes. ask you to move on because I think it's the, the, the positions have been laid out very well. Mm -hmm. uh, yours has, and, okay. uh, and we've, we've, we've given you uh, our thoughts about that. Can we sure. move on to the sentencing issue? Because I'm wondering if we were to say that uh, that uh, the defendant should be resentenced, what would what would be your second sentencing recommendation and why would it not uh, be double jeopardy? Well, I, I, I can't speak for my office yet. I don't think we've discussed this, but uh, let's, for the sake of argument, assume that our sentencing recommendation would be the, the same sentence that ultimately came down from the appellate division, that on one of the two remaining life felonies, either the armed burglary or the mass armed robbery, whichever has considered more serious, that the defendant received that same 30 to 35 year sentence and that the remaining sentence stay at 10 to 15 concurrent. Hey, hold on, you didn't get that. He got, he got 15 years for each of the other two offenses. Correct? Right, and he got 30 to 35 on the armed home invasion. So, he, but, so he's got 30 to 35 on something that if we decide against you, there's not sufficient evidence for. Then we have two 15 year sentences, which, Judge Agostini applied consecutively where we wouldn't have a problem because we'd have a 30 year sentence here um, from your perspective, I take it. If Judge Agostini's solution were proper and hadn't been reversed, we'd have a 30 year sentence, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And we don't. We got the, the appellate division decided that was wrong and made them concurrent. That creates a problem because we're going to either have to double the sentence and doesn't that run into all our capping decisions on double jeopardy that we can't? I don't, I don't believe so. The, the basic premise but prior to Scott and this court's uh, acceptance of that statement in Scott about where the term of time has expired, the rule was in terms of a, and I don't think there's a real quarrel here that this wasn't the judge's intention was an interdependent, interdependent sentencing scheme, a structure that imposed a serious amount of time incarceration for this defendant. I don't think that's, it, certainly that's, that's the possibility that that was the judge's intention. And normally the judge under our case law where one of those convictions has been removed, the judge has provided the opportunity to restructure his initial sentencing scheme, his in this case, to meet his, in, his in, original intentions and purposes, which in this case was a lengthy period of car, incarceration, more than 10 to 15 years. And so those cases also- the sentence has been fully served, even if the sentence has been fully served? There's not, until Salop and, and until Scott and Salop, the, well, the sentence, if it was the judge's uh, original disposition, the sentence wouldn't have been fully served. It would never have been fully served because they were on and after. If you well, accept we that salad the rule, uh, the, the other problem, maybe more go at the back end. You get an absurd, uh, what Commonwealth says is really an unfair 
and almost a perverse result here because the only difference here between what's happening now, 12, almost 14 years after this trial, and what might have happened 10 years ago is that the 15 years on the 10 to 15 has run up. Let's suppose this defendant had brought the same motion for new trial five years ago. And this court made a decision and decided the home evidence for home invasion was insufficient. And the 10 to 15 year sentences on the other two life felonies had not expired. There's nothing in their case law says that it couldn't go back to the judge and he could not impose a different sentence there because the defendant didn't have any- I thought there, there, is, there is case law. I don't- it, we, The case law says we can't give a longer sentence than he got, not just that whether he's fulfilled it. We've said you can't make, you can't give a longer sentence as well in that same due process. I'm not aware of a case that says that. The case is the aggregate punishment can't exceed the, the an aggregate punishment in the resentencing can't exceed the right. aggregate but, punishment but the in the original you, sentence. Yeah, but the problem is that, no, by the way, none of those cases involve an insufficient evidence conviction that's been thrown out. That all of those cases deal with community parole, right? Uh, lifetime pro community parole. This, we're going to allow you to restructure a sentence when to make it the length of the period of time given for the conviction that we've now found insufficient evidence for, if that's what we do, that would be, that's got to raise some double jeopardy issues, doesn't it? Uh, well, I suppose it, you can say it raises double jeopardy issues, but from the Commonwealth's position, the defendant's only expectation of finality of is in the aggregate sentence. And the court, is, the court has said, when that sentence structure is taken apart by the removal of one sentence, the judge at least should be given the opportunity. Let's suppose that at the end of the trial, this motion had been made for insufficient home invasion evidence and the judge had agreed and was left with those two life felonies. From all appearances, based upon the judge's comments and the severity of the crime, regardless of the particular crime for which he was, the defendant was convicted, from all appearances, the judge likely, or there's an, an impossibility, and the judge would have sentenced this defendant to the same serious amount of time on the remaining two life felonies in some form or okay. another. Attorney two Greenbaum? Yes. Attorney Greenbaum? Yes. Thank you. I understand why you say that it should be this way and you're giving us mm -hmm. hypotheticals of how you know it, it might have been different but we have to deal with what we have before us thank you for your argument i'm going to move on to uh attorney smith good, <clears throat> good morning may it please the court my name is andrew smith and i represent mr tinsley Today, I'm asking this court to affirm Judge Agostini's grant of Mr. Tinsley's motion, Rule 30 motion. And regarding the sentencing issue, we're simply asking that the court affirm what it's already established in cases like Perillo, Cumming, Cole, Salop, and Scott, that the defendant may not be resentenced on a component sentence that has been completed. Counsel, um, can I ask you a question? One, and, and this, um, I'm not sure we've, this is, actually in this case, but is there any argument that the regular home invasion statute would be a lesser included of this and that could just be the, the uh, result that uh, the case, the judge should have reduced the decision, reduced the charge? Uh, that certainly hasn't been briefed. Um, okay. I didn't think so, yeah. I was, uh, never mind. I'm a little, Mr. Smith, I'm troubled yeah. by the fact that, um, that again, the, the purpose of the burglary statute and the purpose of the home invasion statutes are a little different. The burglary, we're protecting property. And we've adopted a broad interpretation of dwelling house to make sure that the whole area is protected, right? Then here it's going to result in, a broad interpretation is going to result in less protection for the people in the house, which seems sort of strange. And just walk me through why that makes sense. Because by broadly interpreting where you enter, we're now gonna leave these people unprotected from somebody who 
you know, when they enter into the core of the house, they've armed themselves knowing their people in there. Your Honor, um, listening to the Commonwealth's argument, um, the, 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 the flip side to that argument, the defendant's side to that argument, was at least suggested in the first 15 minutes that the Commonwealth overcharged. The, the words of the statute are clear. Ruiz is clear. If you enter the dwelling place of another while armed, it's the third element of the crime. And counsel, there's some logic to that, isn't there? In that it, it demonstrates an intent. Uh, um, if you go into the home, whether it's the, the, the garage that's attached or any other part of the home that's, you know, coherent structure, the if you go if you enter with the with a weapon, there's a different intent than if you go in and grab a weapon when you're in there. Is that right? That's certainly the, the rationale behind Ruiz and the rationale, despite the Commonwealth's arguments about legislative intent, that intent of bringing a weapon into the garage or into an outhouse or into the house at all, does it, it suggests an intent to harm that grabbing a screwdriver in the garage spontaneously may not. I get that, I get that, but this is different from Ruiz, right? In Ruiz, you're inside the house and then you, you know, you're in a scuffle and you pick something up and you hit, in that case, uses a crutch to hit the victim. Here, these guys are piddling around in the garage and then they get a weapon and the place that where they're really going to encounter people most likely they're armed when they enter into that it's just it is an art i mean you may be right but it just doesn't produce a very protective result here um and when clearly when they're breaking into the house the core part of the house with a screwdriver it, um, perhaps one one point to think about on this issue is we're assuming that the screwdriver was a weapon when it was grabbed from the wherever the box in the garage. We don't know what they thought it was at the time they grabbed it. It may have been a way to open the door. It may well, have I, been a way to. I, I take it though you're 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 out of luck if they're entering the garage with that that screwdriver, right? Just... Enter the curtilage, but sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I, I think the case law actually extends past the garage, um, the curtilage being somewhat outside of the house. Right. No, but no. yes, if if they're in their car with screwdrivers and walk down the driveway, yes, this is we're not here right now. It would well, not be an argument. If if, if, if you're right. Uh, as it relates to the home invasion, and we move on to sentencing, then if there's no resentencing, then the intent of uh, Judge Agostini and indeed the, uh, the um, uh, uh, resentencing that, that took place with uh, the sentencing appeal isn't realized. So let's say you had a situation where a defendant's convicted of of uh, rape of a child and indecent assault and battery in a child. And the judge imposes a lengthy sentence on the rape of the child, but probation on the indecent A and B because they want supervision from and after the committed sentence. It's a very serious case. The rape gets reversed on, on an issue that has nothing to do with the indecent A and B. The judge who may have given an 18 or 20 on the rape uh, can't do anything at resentencing, and the result is a straight probation on the indecent A and B? If we have the same problem with double jeopardy, yes. If I understood your question. You, you, you understand it. If I do, so that's yeah. what happens. The result is a straight probationary sentence. It, it, Um, I'm, you understand the question. On the you, you're on it. 
He sensed on the rape. It gets reversed. It was an 18 to 20. I'm sorry? I'm, no, he could be, I, I believe he could be resentenced on this indecent. Had he completed and, and what's the, the difference with this case that, it, that the sentence wrapped up? Isn't that the sentence wrapped up? It's he's already served. So he's is served that the it. only difference? That, there's, that the, uh, they already wrapped up on that? Um, I'd, ref I'd refer your honor to the case of Cole. I mean, there are a number of them in our brief as well as the Commonwealth's brief. The, um, I understand, but if, if, it, if they hadn't wrapped up, you say there could be a resentencing. Uh, if we, but I'll say this, if we had the original sentence, sentencing, the original sentences of Judge Agostini, then. No, no, I'm not, that's just not the oh, sentence, that, that's, that's not pertinent. The sentencing no, if, appeal. If he had not completed his sentence, he would be, it, it, there would be the possibility of resentencing, yes. Okay. So the delay in yours to your benefit. <laughs> if we were games, if this was gamesmanship, I would have waited a little longer. Huh. Um, it's cutting it awfully close. But the, I, I would just point out one thing. Um, judge Agostini was the trial judge on this case which means that we have a trial judge knowingly overturning the anchor sentence of a admittedly very difficult and brutal case because he understood the 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 the, the evidence was insufficient so i understand it's it it may not be what he intended when he originally sentenced Mr. Tinsley, but that's what happens when the Commonwealth overcharges. That's what happens when cases get overturned. Now, certainly we're in a situation now where the judge intended him to be found guilty of, I mean, the, the judge accepted that he was found guilty of home invasion and sentenced them accordingly. So, so yes, we're gonna- can I ask a question about um, if there wasn't a, um, uh, if the, his sentence hadn't been overturned, uh, the defendant received 10 to 15 after the armed home invasion, which got taken out, but then was to get 10 to 15 on and after the 10 to 15 on the armed burglary, right? That was the original. So he was to get he was to get consecutive on on each of the um, each of those yeah. uh, life felonies, right? That's my recollection. Yes, I think that's right. And so, if there hadn't been a a, a resentencing, he'd have just been reverted back to the ten to fifteen on the armed burglary, and then have to do the consecutive uh, ten to fifteen on the on the armed and mass robbery. As long as the Commonwealth accepted that he was going to do 30 years instead of 60, yes. Got it. So you agree this all turns on whether he's finished it or not? Meaning, meaning they could take your, that 15 and convert it into a 30 if he had two days left on his sentence? No, I, I still, I believe it's an open issue and we argue it's an open issue um, mm -hmm. when a component, well, is this an interdependent sentencing scheme? I think it's an open issue. It's an, it's an open issue in the footnote in Leggett. Well, that seems to be the, the weakest part of your argument that it's not interdependent. It seems clearly interdependent. Um, in fact, you know, the trial judge originally did them as Justice Chief Justice Budd just pointed out, consecutive. Then the appellate division does it concurrent, but they do it concurrent because they have the other 30 out there and they don't want a 45 year sentence or a 60 year sentence. It just, I, 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 it seems to me it's clearly interdependent. The question then is when you have a portion of this that, because we've never had a case where we have insufficient evidence for the longest conviction, do we? None of the cases involve that, right? 
That's correct. And it, it, it's, it's my understanding of the case law, it's an open issue. So we, we did not concede this is interdependent. And I, uh, just on that point, I would- no, no, It's a different, I'm posing a different question. Oh. I'm assuming it's interdependent. Um, I'm also assuming that the trial judge had done two 15s consecutively. You know, this isn't a big deal, but because the appellate division reduced, made them consecutive, with the thought in mind that that's probably fair given that he's already got a 30 for the thing that we've now declared, well, we may declare insufficient evidence for, this gets really, really messy. You're, and you have this sort of simple way that, well, he served it, so we're done, but that just seems kind of not really where we should be focused on whether he served it as opposed to the sentences themselves, because then it becomes a rush to the courthouse or a delay to the courthouse. I mean, I, the, isn't this just what happens when a case gets over, when a charge get over, gets overturned? There's so always we, a degree of messiness, especially in a case that's been this long. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said earlier about the gamesmanship, my timing is bad. Um, I would, I, if I was gaming this, which obviously I didn't, um, I didn't file the original Rule Thirty motion. Um, my question, my point's a little different, though. Both the appellate division and Judge Agostini thought a thirty year. Judge Agostini thought sixty years was appropriate. The appellate division thought thirty years, but it didn't think through the possibility of this getting wiped out, or maybe it did. Um, but but it, now we have a 15 year sentence when everyone thought 30 was appropriate. Yes, but it, this gets back to the issue of didn't they overcharge? Well, no, because even under the other charges, they could have gotten 30 years for any of those, right? Yes, but certainly the home invasion was the, more, the most serious of the three. That was the lead charge. If this was a burglary, would have brought less time if it was they, they believed it to be a burglary. Yeah, but doesn't it depend on? I mean, looking at the facts of what happened, that's that's why they charged. What they charged. Agostini would have given him sixty years on the burglary. Well, it's a hypothetical, but um, certainly the, the idea that it was a home invasion upped the ante on the sentence. I, I, I'm not sure how that can be denied. Well, but we we, we don't have heard. to figure that out. We have to figure out is whether Judge Agostini has a, an opportunity to decide what we're wondering about. And you're saying that, as I hear it, it depends on whether or not somebody has wrapped up uh, the, the, the sentence up, upon which the indictments would uh, have a resentencing. Well, the double jeopardy clause is an inconvenience. No, I, know. I just want to make I mean, sure I, I understand your, your, your position. I it's a matter of timing, as Justice Casiano said. That's your um, position. I mean, I think the premise of much of the, 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 the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments is it's an inconvenience. So certainly, if the lead charge gets overturned, the case law, as documented in our brief, is clear about component sentences. If he served the component sentence, it's over. Yeah, and I guess I go back to to my question that I said. Well, it's not relevant. Never mind. But what, were they instructed on a lesser included on the armed no. home invasion? They weren't. Okay. No. And it, it, it there are consequences to overcharging. And we're, you know, and unfortunately, Attorney Greenbaum in the Commonwealth is living with the consequence of it. Mm -hmm. But okay. all right. Does anyone have any further questions? No, thanks, Chief. Okay. No, thank thank you. you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoy your enjoy your day. You too.